Um, we are going to do a quick run through all of the important things in period five, all right? We want to think about period five as, I don't know, let's call it the revolutionary era, all right? So I want, if, if you hear revolutions, we want to go to period five, unless it's the Neolithic Revolution and then we're period one, but don't make that mistake. So know that that's like where it all begins, right? So revolutions in, in period five. Um, the first revolution that we're going to talk about is, of course, the big one is the... Friendship. Now, the Industrial Revolution. So the first revolution we want to touch on is the Industrial Revolution. And, and why I want to deal with that one first is because literally we give a starting year to the Industrial Revolution to right about 1750 in England. And this period is 1750 to 1900. Or, yeah, 1900. Um, so it's a great place to start. So, uh, and it's the first stuff that's on the AP curriculum for period five. It's all Industrial Revolution. So what are some things we need to remember about the Industrial Revolution? Starts in Europe. Let's even get more focused. It starts in? Britain. Starts in Britain. Very good. The Industrial Revolution begins in Britain. And we ran through a number of reasons why it begins in Britain. What would you give me? Location. Okay, location, location, location. They've got a lot going for them, okay? Some of it was like, a, uh, uh, like deficiencies of their location, right? Um, human beings, we've provided most of our energy that, that doesn't come from like the food we consume or the, the, animal, the food the animals consume. We've gotten most of our energy from the beginning of, of the development of fire, I'm kind of giving you the answer, uh, up to 1750, primarily from burning wood. That's where we like heat energy from burning wood, right? We get a lot of energy from burning wood. Um, and England, being a comparatively small landmass with a comparatively large population, doesn't have the access to like forest lands that some other parts of the world are going to have. So they've got more of a necessity. We've heard that phrase, necessity is the mother of invention, right? Um, they've got more of a necessity to try to use something else as a, as a resource to create energy. They also luck out in the sense that they have something else that's easily accessible or relatively easily accessible, and that is... Well, they've got water and coal. Very good. So, so we've, we've actually used water power um, predating the Industrial Revolution a bit, um, like factories existing on rivers, uh, for example, and putting like a water wheel on that river. Uh, but then uh, what really is going to drive the Industrial Revolution is going to be the use of coal as a new uh, resource. It's a fossil fuel. It can be burned, um, and that heat energy can be used to, for example, boil water create steam, and then a uh, guy named James Watt, uh, inventor of the steam engine, James Watt, um, invents the steam engine, which is going to harness that steam um, in order to drive uh, an engine, right, and to propel whatever it is he's trying to use. And interestingly enough, we, uh, some of the first steam engines were used in mining operations. It's kind of like creating a cycle, right? A steam engine used to get co more coal so you can fuel more steam engines. Uh, so it kind of creates this, this cycle. One note with all of the, um, even today's modern resources, um, uh, typically what we're doing, like if we're talking nuclear power in, in the 20th century, we're still doing the same thing. We're boiling water to make steam. We just use different things in order to boil the water. So the Industrial Revolution begins in England, and it, in part it begins because of that location, because they either lack the wood resources, the lumber resources, or they have good access, or and they have good access to coal resources. Um, another aspect of them being the island nation and starting the Industrial Revolution is that they have far less concern in England about outsiders invading them, right? And this is going to lead to a couple things for, for the English, for the British Empire um, in, the, in the 20th century, or in the uh, 19th century and driving through the Industrial Revolution. When you don't have to worry about outsiders invading you quite as much, you don't have to put a lot of your resources to building a big army. And so you can put your national resources to other endeavors, even economic endeavors, right? Like building dams on rivers and canals and, 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 and putting government money towards the construction of railroad, when you don't have to focus so much on, on the construction of military. Um, also, the Industrial Revolution is going to require far more natural resources, far more raw materials than you could ever get out of your own nation. And if you're a country that doesn't have to spend a lot of money on building an army, you can put those resources into building 
what that might help you conquer overseas territories. You can build navies. So we always remember Britain having the most powerful navy in the 19th, uh, or 18th, 19th, 20th century. If you've got a powerful navy, you can extend your empire much more easy. And during the Industrial Revolution, we need to do that because we've got to get raw materials from throughout the world. On the flip side of that, Britain, because they can build an empire, has got access to a lot of markets that they can sell the products from their factories into. All right? So the Industrial Revolution begins in England around 1750, and then it's going to spread from there. It's going to spread into continental Europe, particularly places like Belgium and Germany. It's going to spread eventually across the Atlantic into the United States. It's going to spread eventually into Russia, far in, into the east. It's going to spread eventually into a place as, as far east as, as Japan. All right. So it starts in England, 1750. Um, we want to remember some, as, uh, some effects of the Industrial Revolution. So we kind of know a little bit about the cause, some of the effects of the Industrial Revolution. So let's think about um, some political effects of the Industrial Revolution. And that's something I'm going to hit on tomorrow really hard when we have our, our big review with the entire school. We've got to do a better job um, differentiating between political, economic, social, cultural effects um, of, of anything, right? When we're talking politics, we're talking how governments run or how, how legal systems are developed, right? Um, the operations of governments. Maybe conflict and war, that fits into politics. If we're talking economics, we're talking trade and finance and, and business operations, um, taxes. If we're talking social issues or social changes over time, we're talking how people interact with each other. Um, are there social classes that are developing? Um, are there gender imbalances uh, that, are, that are being created? And then cultural. Um, you know, the art and the architecture of a society. Uh, maybe the religions of a society. So we've got to make sure we're really comfortable with this. So now let's take our Industrial Revolution and look at the impact on politics and on economies and on social issues and on cultural issues. So what would we say for politics? What's the impact? to the Industrial Revolution on global politics. Yes? Centralization. Centralization. What do you mean? Okay, we're, we're going to have... Well, that's going to happen much earlier. Japan is going to go from a feudalist state to a more centralized state earlier um, by about 1600 with the Tokugawa shogunate. But what we will have is by 1867, the rise of the Meiji Emperor, the, what's known as the Meiji Restoration. This idea that Japan has to modernize or they'll fall behind. So bringing Japan up is really important, though, for a political um, a change because of the Industrial Revolution. Before the Industrial Revolution, there wasn't really anybody outside of Japan that had to give Japan any consideration. Japan was a relatively isolated state. And then the Industrial Revolution comes along, and Japan looks across at China and sees China being dominated by an industrial power, Britain, right, with the Opium Wars. And Japan says, we don't want that same thing happening to us. So they are going to make the decision to actively pursue industrialization. So one effect, I guess we could say, political effect of the Industrial Revolution is that Japan is going to move to industrialize, which is then going to make Japan weak or powerful, far more powerful. They will defeat China in a war. That's never happened, guys. We've studied Japan and China uh, for, for the entire year here, and China has always been the dominant power in Asia. And by 1894, with Japan more industrialized than China, the Chinese will be defeated in a war. And then in 1904, the Japanese will fight the Russians, and they'll win in the Russo-Japanese War. Now you have a, an Asian nation in the modern era that is defeating a white European power. That's pretty big. So I would say that bringing up Japan is a huge effect of the Industrial Revolution, a huge political effect. Give me some other political effects. Uh, like, so we're talking about like uh, political changes that are happening because of the Industrial Revolution. David, what do you got? What's that? He said, he said that England is going to become the world's most powerful empire. All right. We didn't have it before the Industrial Revolution. England was important. But remember, England was one of a number of European countries competing for overseas colonies in the mercantilist era. Right. 
before the Industrial Revolution, what, what European country had the biggest empire in the world? It was Spain. Very good. It was Spain. Spain had almost all of South America, except for Brazil. They had all of Latin America. They had half of what is today the United States. So, so Spain had um, a, a lot of that empire. And then the Industrial Revolution comes along, and now we start saying like, things like the sun never sets on the British Empire. They're going to control territory in North America. They're going to control Canada. They're going to control uh, Australia. They're going to control India, which was the most valuable colony of any uh, colonies during the, the Age of Empires. Uh, they're going to control an unbroken band of colonies from, from Egypt all the way down to South Africa. So no one's going to have a bigger empire than, than England, and that's because they are able to industrialize first. Awesome. What other political effects are we going to have of the Industrial Revolution? Yeah. I don't know if this counts, but like new ways of thinking. Mm, say what you're going to say, and then I'll say if you're right. Like uh, having more of like a classless society. Can we say, you're right. Let's save that, though. Uh, more of a classless society. And, and I, I'm going to disagree with you in a little bit. But when we're talking classes, we're talking social issues. We'll get there in a second. Um, other political changes. Okay, so when we're thinking about continuities and changes over time, which is what we're doing here, we want to think about what was it like before the Industrial Revolution? What were the big empires that we talked a lot about? And then what's it going to be like after? We've already established that Japan is going to be on the rise. Uh, England is certainly going to be on the rise. Who's maybe on the decline? Yeah. Um, it's like the political um, I would put that under uh, the economics, and we'll talk about capitalism and communism as a response to that in just a moment. So we talk, empires on the rise, empires declining, yeah. Okay, the Ottoman Empire, very good. The Ottoman Empire in the, in the 14 and 1500s was a dominant empire. Um, in the early 1500s, Suleiman the Magnificent was like pushing all the way to the gates of Vienna, Austria. The Ottoman Empire conquered the Byzantine Empire in 1453. So they are a powerhouse empire. But they are slow to industrialize compared to Western Europe. All right? Part of the reason they're slower to industrialize is because their government, and especially like the Janissaries that run the military, they're a little bit nervous about their country industrializing. Remember, when you industrialize, your armies start to look a lot different, right? Um, industrialized army, the militaries earlier in history, before we've industrialized, tend to be run and led by elite warriors. Guys that like literally spend their lives training to fight. Whether they're Japanese samurai or the knights of medieval Europe or what class of warrior in the Ottoman Empire? The Janissaries. Very good, the Janissaries. I'm not afraid because I know you would, if you saw it on your test, you'd be, oh yeah, I know who those guys are. The Janissaries, right? So these are guys, these were these, these Christian boys that were kind of taken up as young boys and trained to be elite soldiers within the Ottoman Empire. And, and they train and they do become elite soldiers within the Ottoman Empire. But then the world starts to industrialize. And elite soldiers, elite warriors, start to lose a little bit of, a little bit of their importance. Because even if you are an elite samurai, right, 50 soldiers with mass-produced rifles can take care of you, right? And like regular guys that you just teach how to fire a gun. They don't have to train their entire lives to be soldiers. And you just recruit a lot of them. And, and Western European armies just started doing this. They started conscripting their citizens to be soldiers, whether it be for like a year or two or three of service, right? And we can mass produce uniforms and we can mass produce boots and we can mass produce rifles, which starts to negate the importance of those traditional soldiers, right? Whether it be the samurai or the janissary. Well, the janissaries were pretty powerful within the Ottoman Empire. They don't want change. They're discouraging this kind of change. And unfortunately, it's going to cause the Ottoman Empire to lag behind what Western Europe's doing. Doing. And so they'll, we'll call them the sick men of Europe, the sick man of Europe. They're a weaker state because they fail to industrialize. Who else really fails to industrialize well? What's that? Russia. Say it out loud proud. Russia. Russia is a little bit slower to industrialize. They do. They do have some level of industrialization, but Russia was, was long behind what was going on in, in Western Europe. Um, so when it comes to fighting against the Japanese in 1904 or in World War I even, Russia couldn't compete as well with the newly industrialized and rapidly industrializing Japanese country or with the, their German enemies in World War I. 
Uh, China is another country that we could say was long dominant, but fails to industrialize as rapidly as Western European powers. So they're, of course, going to be dominated by Britain in the Opium Wars, and then other European powers are going to hop in. So those would be some like, big and important political changes. The United States. The United States, we only become a powerhouse, an economic powerhouse around the world once we've begun to industrialize. All right. So industrialization, the countries that are able to effectively do it, um, end up being much more powerful, especially militarily. Remember a push last year when you guys studied the American Civil War? You had the industrial north fighting against the more agrarian or agriculturally based south. And who had most of the advantages in that, in that American Civil War? And not surprisingly, who won? The North. They were industrialized. They could produce the weapons, and that's what wins wars. Let's talk about economics. Um, economic continuities and changes over time. Let's talk about the changes first. When we're talking about economics, we're talking about how we do business. Yes? Different ways of doing business. Different ways of doing business. Okay, and what do you want to say? Give me a word that, you would asso- that that's like you're associating with that. Business. Well, I act- Okay, so in, okay, uh, um, I think this is important. For most of human history, most wealth uh, generation around the world came from your land. If you lived on or owned the land, you could grow food on the land, or you had resources within your land. That's where wealth comes from, right? After the Industrial Revolution, you don't need a lot of land. You need maybe an idea. You need an idea, a way to produce something in a, that hasn't been done before. You need to try to mechanize the production of whatever it is you're making. And you don't need a ton of land to do it on. So a guy like Henry Ford that, that makes a, a relatively small factory compared to like the big landowners in, in human history, he's got a re- relatively small hunk of land in Highland Park, Michigan that he makes his first assembly line in. But he's got a new idea, and that new idea, that new industrialized idea, can make him one of the wealthiest human beings on the planet, right? So new ways to develop or to grow wealth. Very good. Uh, What else? I want to – what's that? What's that? Okay, we're going to see a a shift. Uh, We've long talked about, like, the Silk Road being the most important trade route in uh, in world history. Um, After – the, the 1500s, when Europeans start entering into the Indian Ocean trade and they connect themselves directly to Indian Ocean trade, that will certainly grow. But by, by the Industrial Age, there will absolutely be more oceanic trade, trade going from the Americas to Europe or trade going from Asia to Europe um, than, than any land-based trade systems. So the growth in the Atlantic trade network, growth in the Indian Ocean trade network, absolutely true. Let's talk about the big driving economic ideals. Uh, mercantilism. And then capitalism. Pre-industrialization, mercantilism wins the day. This idea that governments should support their local economies through things like tariffs and quotas, trying to keep outside products out. So a nation's wealth stays within itself. That rhymes. Mercantilism. A nation's wealth stays within itself. Hmm. Okay, work with it if you want it. Um, So... That's the mercantilist idea. And you have to go out and get colonies for mercantilism because you need somebody to trade with, but you want them to be your own subject. So the British colonies in the Americas would trade with with the mother country in, in England, right? By the industrial age... A newer idea will start to develop. Capitalism, based a lot, much on uh, the writings, or reflected by the writings, of a guy named Adam Smith. Smith. Very good. Um, I can't write right now. Um, Adam Smith, who is going to say, governments need to get out of the marketplace. Hands off, laissez-faire. Let the people and, and businesses do what is best for them. And so if you are British, but you think the French make the best wine, by God, buy French wine. Don't hold back. Get what you want. And, and don't buy lesser products from England that might even be more expensive. Just buy what you want to buy. And then that will open up the British people to produce what they can do best. And when people make what they are best at and what they want to make, um, and then they trade for those things they don't have, 
everybody is better off, right? It's this idea that, like, in, in Florida they grow oranges, and in Michigan we grow, like, cherries. Can we grow oranges in Michigan? We can put a guy in the moon and we can't grow an orange in Michigan? Can we grow oranges in Michigan? Yeah. Sure, of course we can grow oranges in Michigan. They would just have to be in like a greenhouse or something, right? But who can grow oranges easier, Michigan or Florida? So let Florida grow the oranges, and then we'll grow the cherries, and then we'll just trade with each other. That's better for everybody involved. Because if, if Michigan, stupidly, decided to grow a bunch of oranges, then our oranges would be very expensive, right? And, and that would be a waste of our land and our resources. So that's the capitalist idea. And that's going to kind of overturn the mercantilist idea. Trade with anybody. Make as much as you can. Do what you do best. And this will start to overtake mercantilism. Now, are there flaws in this system? Absolutely. Capitalism encourages individuals to do what works out best for them. All right? To try to maximize their own profits. And for some individuals, they will really be able to maximize their profits. Don't be afraid to use the stuff that you've learned in AP U.S. history as knowledge and evidence for AP world history. Can you think of any individuals' names that you would drop in for very wealthy industrialists? Yes, ma'am. Andrew Carnegie, the steel magnate. Yes. Nelson Rockefeller. Very, or no, not Nelson Rockefeller. That's like his grandson. He was a politician. Uh, John D. Rockefeller. Thank you. J.P. Morgan, Cornelius Vanderbilt, whatever. Drop any of these guys in. Henry Ford would be fine. Henry Ford. What did you say, Nisha? I didn't say anything. Okay, but you're, you're like rolling your eyes at me or something right now. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. It's okay. It's okay. All right, you don't need that. Um, so some within this capitalist model are going to become wildly wealthy. And some are going to become really wealthy because they start like creating monopolies and things like that to, to dominate an industry, and then they can just raise the prices. Some are going to become wildly wealthy, while many others are going to become horribly, horribly impoverished, right? They're going to hardly be scraping by, living in horrid conditions, working in even worse conditions. Now, uh, this is bleeding a little bit into a social issue, but as a reaction to the capitalist system, some are going to argue that this is inherently in unfair, that those that have advantages in society are going to win, and those that have disadvantages in society are going to lose. And so as a reaction to capitalism, we're going to see the development of communism or socialism. And we want to associate that with Karl Marx. Karl Marx and his socialist ideas or his communist manifesto is a reaction to the problems inherent in capitalism. And Karl Marx would say, this is garbage. The workers are doing all the hard work while the fat cat owner is making, making all the money. The workers should just rise up and overthrow the ownership class and start a revolution of what he called the, a revolution of the proletariat, the working class. They should overthrow the bourgeoisie class, that, that, that ownership class. Um, this is a reality of the mid-19th century and later, and some governments will start to give in a little bit to these ideas that, that there should be reform and regulation of businesses. And much of that is to encourage communist revolutions from not happening. Governments are actually going to give in to um, the demands of some workers in order to avoid the threats of communist governments taking over, all right? So um, those are some economic changes. Uh, awesome. Social changes. Changes in the social class. Uh, continuity. Are there rich people before the Industrial Revolution? Are there poor people before the Industrial Revolution? Are there rich people after the Industrial Revolution? Are there poor people after the... Yeah, okay, so that's a continuity. But it... What's that? It, then, then, then a change. Then a change. At, during the Industrial Revolution, we're going to see the growth of a much larger middle class. There's always been a little bit of a middle class. Maybe they're artisans or they're merchants or something like this. But the vast majority of human society used to be, used to be either a tiny fraction, tiny sliver of wealthy landowners, and then a massive population of peasant workers of the land. And now we're going to have new social classes develop. A middle class is going to grow. A much larger middle class is going to go grow. Uh, these are the people maybe that are the, the managers of the factory systems, right? The, the, the ones who, who, who run the factories during the day. Not the working class, but the managers of it. Um, these are going to be uh, people in like new industries that are developing banking and insurance industries. 
Maybe these are going to be people that have made investments in many companies and they've made a good return off of their investments. So they're going to be a, a new middle class that will develop. We're also going to have a new kind of poor class. The poorest people had always been factory workers, right? Or pardon me. The poorest people had always been peasants in society. But now that we have a factory system and that takes very low-skilled labor, you don't have to have a lot of education, uh, you don't even have to speak the language to work in a factory, we're going to have a new lower class of these workers. Uh, Karl Marx calls them the proletariat class. So that's going to be a new class that develops. Um, also with regard to, um, and then, of course, the wealthy are still going to be wealthy, but we're going to have a new wealthy class. Not just the wealthy aristocracy that happens to be landowners. We're going to have now wealthy business owners, the, these, these guys that we just talked about, the uh, robber barons or captains of industry or whatever you'd want to call them, the wealthy industrialists, those that are going to make huge profits off of the Industrial Revolution. This is going to bleed over a little bit into um, other aspects of, of, of society. Um, the, the relationship between men and women during the Industrial Revolution, what are we going to see? What's that? A fight for equality is going to start. There's going to be a handful of women, and you guys remember probably a little bit from a push last year. There's going to be a push for like women's suffrage uh, that will start in the 19th century, women having the right to vote, women getting a political voice. We're going to see women, yeah? Women starting to leave the home and start to work more, especially urban women, um, the urban lower class women, like, like lower socioeconomic class women, uh, entering into factories and working more. And as women are going to be working more, what's going to happen to the size of families? We're going to start to see the size of families shrink. All right, so we're going to have fewer children because mom's off working, can't take care of as many children. So we're going to see fewer children. Um, so families are going to tend to shrink. We're also going to see um, more of a rise of what we call in Western society the nuclear family. Um, in most earlier generations of, of civilizations, uh, we in most of these earlier areas, we would see families um, that would often have fathers and mothers and children, but also grandparents and, and aunts and aunts, like many, many people like working very close together on maybe some family land, right? And now we live in an era, this really begins during the Industrial Revolution, where it's, you don't have as much room in a, in a house, in an urban area, right? Your apartment might not be that big. So we're going to have more nuclear families, mom, dad, kids, right? And mom is going to work. Uh, mom is going to be more likely to work. I'm not, not all moms are going out to work. Mom is going to be more likely to work and, and leave the home during the day. And so what are the kids going to do during the day? You guys learned this about last year in A-Push. Yeah, the, the first in, Western, in the Western world, schools are going to start. You need something to do with kids during the day, right? So kids are going to be educated more than they ever have. Literacy rates are going to grow. We've got a lot of impacts from the Industrial Revolution on, on society. And then when it comes to cultural issues, um, with, with regard to um, uh, things like religion and art and architecture, um, a lot of art um, in literature is going to reflect this new industrial age. Um, authors like Charles Dickens, I know, Cross, and you guys probably talked a little bit about Charles Dickens. Authors like, and like Charles Dickens are going to like reflect a lot of, of the problems of the industrial age, um, the issues in society. Do you guys remember talking last year in A Push about a guy named Jacob Rees who wrote about how the other half lives? He took pictures of poor people in New York City to kind of highlight how they're living their lives. That would be an aspect of, of, of culture at, at the time. But there's also a lot of continuities. The religions are going to stay largely the same. You know, the, the established religions prior to this period aren't really going to be changing um, at, at all. And, and that's good. So that's our first big revolution. Cool, Leo? Cool. Now I want to spend some time talking about the other revolutions of the era, and those would be the political revolutions. Those would be the political revolutions. And there are four political revolutions that I want you guys to be well aware of. And let's give them an order. So the first is going to be in 1775 it actually starts. And that's us, right? The American Revolution. And then we can go to 1789 for the French. Very good. And then um, we late uh, 1790s into the early 1800s uh, to the Haitian Revolution. And then like 1820s and after Latin American revolutions. 
So we've got a series of political revolutions. Um, I, you know, I, you'll never have to answer a question about which of these was. Your bus is waiting out front. Hurry up. They are leaving in two minutes. Um, there, you're never going to have a question like which revolution, what was the most important revolution of, of, of this era or something. Because the, the, uh, the Industrial Revolution is a very different type of revolution, right? That's like on the lines of, of Neolithic Revolution. That's like the kind of revolution that like literally changes the way human beings live their lives. These are all just changes in government. They're big deals, but they're all just changes in government. Um, collectively speaking, though, I like to address which of these revolutions were, um, were like the most revolutionary, all right? Now, I, you can make an argument that the American Revolution is the most revolutionary because it's the first one and it's really an inspiration for the other, others that come. Um, but I think in my class, I really touched on this guy being the, the biggest wholesale change in the way people, the uh, way society and culture worked in, during this era. Um, collectively, though, if we wanted to say what is like one factor that caused all of these revolutions, what do we point to? Yes. Enlightenment, very good. The Enlightenment, um, late 1600s into the 1700s, right? Uh, European thinkers thinking about new ways to solve the problems of society or looking at the society they live in and saying, that doesn't seem quite right, and trying to formulate new ideas about how to improve things, right? That's the Enlightenment. Now, if we want to step one, one step back, um, give me a cause of the Enlightenment. What, what is, why does the Enlightenment happen in the late 17, or late 16 and into the 1700s? Yeah. Isn't it come out of the Dark Ages? Well, it's kind of coming out of the Dark Ages, but I don't think we're going to have, and, and I don't even like the phrase Dark Ages uh, for the Middle Ages of Western Europe because, does Crossan use that? He uses middle. He uses middle, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't love the Dark Ages because that really implies that nothing was happening in Western Europe and yeah, I don't want to go there. But I think we have to have something bef after the Middle Ages but before the Enlightenment because we got like 15, 16 uh, hundreds to deal with. Yeah. There is a scientific revolution where Europeans started to look at the natural world more and I think there is a deep connection between scientists looking at the natural world and realizing we can come up with answers to things we might not have been able to explain before and then that kind of bleeding into changes in how we look at the social world or the political world we live in. We see the same thing during this period five with a guy like Charles Darwin who formulates his theory of evolution, and then some Europeans will look at that and say, hey, that kind of it gives us a reason why Europeans are dominating the world, and they call it social Darwinism. So there's definitely a connection between the scientific revolution and the enlightenment that follows. Yeah. The plague. Mm, I don't know if I can draw. How would you draw a connection between the plague and the enlightenment? Because enlightenment was a turn to scientific thinking, right? And the uh, plague sort of Okay, maybe it wanted it, it caused people to look for a more rational reason why all these people were dying than merely the spiritual. Could be, could be. What I want to go is, it, let's give a more direct cause. The Enlightenment was a reaction to what going on in Europe? Okay, time out. The Enlightenment tried, like, what were some of the ideas of the Enlightenment? Let's, let's work backwards. Ideas of the Enlightenment, give me. Like, what were they thinking? Yes, ma'am. Okay, figure things out through reason and logic, okay? You, there's got to be a reasoned answer to the questions that we have, especially our social and political questions. Sure. What were some of the issues that, that Enlightenment thinkers were, were thinking about? What were they writing about? Anything. Yeah. Rights. Rights. Good. Like what? Natural rights. Natural rights. Give me the natural rights. Life. Life, liberty, and property. Very good. Or you don't say life, liberty, and land. You knock your socks off. Life, liberty, and property. Who was the guy that was writing about life, liberty, and property in the 17th century? John Locke. Very good. So why would somebody ever think it is truly important to write down in a book called Two Treatises on Government that human beings, we all have natural rights, and they are life, liberty, and the ability to own property. Why would anyone ever feel the need to write that down? Yes? Because they want to show the problem. 
Okay, you write that kind of stuff down because you don't really think it's always being respected, right? You don't, we don't complain about things that aren't problems, right? You don't write, if you are Rousseau, uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who's writing a book called The Social Contract, where you believe that there is an inherent unsigned contract between people and the, uh, the government that they live in, where the government should be a good government and we should be good citizens, and this is just like from birth how it's supposed to work. You aren't writing that if you think you're already living in a perfectly good government. Remember Confucius from the beginning of the year, right? He's living in the Zhou dynasty, and he's talking about ways to have a better government. Does he like how the government of Zhou is operating? No, it's, not, it's, not, it's a pretty weak, decentralized state. They've got a lot of problems. So you don't write the Analex if things are going well. You write the Analex if you've got a lot of beef with what's going on, right? That's Confucius' book where he like, lays out his things on how to run a better state. So you aren't an Enlightenment thinker if, if everything is going hunky-dory, if you're in love with, every, uh, with all the ways your society is writing, or, or living. Uh, Voltaire is critiquing the Roman Catholic religion and its connection with the government of France. Do you think he likes the connection between religion and government in France? No. So he writes a play called Candide that critiques it and satirizes um, the, the government of, of France and the, the, the Roman Catholic Church's close relationship, right? Um, Baron de Montesquieu writes about um, separating the powers of government between branches of government like legislative, executive, and judicial. Do you think he thinks that's a good idea because it's happening and he wants to share this idea? No, it's not happening, and it's an idea he wants to happen, right? Um, blah, blah, blah. Who else do I want to go with? Um, any of these guys writing about the idea that, that an absolute monarch is a bad thing and many of them are French, an absolute monarch, a, a king who says, I rule absolutely. Uh, Louis XIV said, I am the state. Louis XIV said, the only person that can challenge my authority is God above. This is this idea of divine rights of kings, right? You don't, like, if, there is no enlightenment thinker if Louis XIV was a, a benevolent king, if he shared power, if he ruled more justly. But because he was this absolute monarch, people challenged that. So they challenge it with their writings, right? And these become the Enlightenment thinkers. And by 1776, Thomas Jefferson's going to plagiarize uh, John Locke and say that we all have inalienable rights. And then among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So that starts it all. And we're going to break from the kingdom of England, right? We're going to sever our relationship with that king. And we start, we declare our independence. Does England want to let us go? No, no. And we fight a war with them, and ultimately England decides they've had enough, and they're going to stop fighting, and poof, we've got our independence, right? French Revolution in 1789. French Revolution in 1789 follows on the heels of the American Revolution. And they use all these Enlightenment thinkers that are many of them are homegrown. They're French. And they move the same direction. They're going to get rid of their king as well, right? But they go even further. They actually take the king whose family has been ruling France for a couple centuries, they take the king and they put him on trial and they find him guilty and they sever his head, right? They chop off his head and his wife's head. They totally end the monarchy in France. That's why we say this is a more complete political revolution. After the American Revolution, the king of England is still on his throne. After the French Revolution, the king of England's head is in a basket. And again, listen to Hamilton if you're not doing that. Um, because now I've got it going through my head. Um, the French Revolution is also going to do what Jean-Jacques Rousseau said, or, uh, pardon me, Voltaire said, separate the relationship between church and state, and this connection between the Roman Catholic Church and the government of France. In my class, we talked about a brand new calendar. We're going to get rid of the Christian-based calendar, where year one is like the birth of Christ, um, and our days, are, we have seven days in the week, because it took God six days to create the universe, and on the seventh he rested. In the French Revolution, we're going to have Year 1B, 1789, the first year of the French Revolution. And the weeks are going to have 10 days in them um, because that seems to make more rational, reasonable sense mathematically. So that's where they're going to go. That revolution, French Revolution, was not a complete revolution, though, because before the French Revolution, in French society and in the French Empire, were there slaves? Yep. And some Enlightenment thinkers said slavery was bad. But the French Revolution didn't touch that because why? 
they need them. They're bringing a lot of money. Haiti is a big sugar colony, for, and it's making a lot of money for France. So they hold on to slavery. So it wasn't maybe the most complete revolution it could have been. And in France, in a reaction to the French Revolution and the lack of, of emancipation for, for the slaves in France, um, a man named Toussaint Louverture, we should know his name, Toussaint Louverture, will lead a revolution of, of slaves in Haiti. Toussaint? L, then the word Overture. Toussaint Louverture will lead a revolution of, of uh, slaves against their slave owners. France will send an army to try to put it down. But just like it was kind of hard for Britain to win an American revolution, because we're so far away from the home base of, of England, it's kind of hard for France to win this Haitian revolution, because they're so far away. And then the 1820s, on the heels of these previous revolutions, we're going to see uh, the, the beginning of the Latin American revolutions. The leader of those is going to be Simon Bolivar. Now, this is a pretty incomplete revolution. Before the, uh, the, the Latin American revolutions, obviously Spain and Portugal, or pardon me, Spain and Brazil, oh, goodness gracious, Spain and Portugal controlled uh, the Latin American colonies, uh, Spanish America and, and Brazil, After, and, and they were run by wealthy white people, right? After the Latin American revolutions, this, these nations are going to be free from the kings, but still run by wealthy white people, just different wealthy white people. Um, the Peninsulares were the leading social class of Latin America before the Latin American Revolution. Simon Bolivar was an angry, not Peninsulari, but an angry Creole. Very good. The sons of the Peninsulares. They were white people born in the Americas. So Simon Bolivar says, we Creoles have been here all our lives. We have as much right to have a political voice and to be controlling this, this colony as anybody. And then he looks to the north and he's like, they got their independence in America and they, even the Haitians got their independence from France. We deserve it too. And so Simon Bolivar will launch this revolution against Spanish control and he ultimately wins. All right? So we've got political revolutions. We've got the Industrial Revolution. Uh, that's where I want you to be living uh, in period five. Yes, ma'am. So, oh, oh, did I never say that? My bad. So, so what, I thought I did. Um, or maybe I just didn't say it very clearly. What caused the Enlightenment was people, I, I did say it, but maybe I didn't make it clear. People living in a really crappy situation politically. Like, French people living in a France that was ruled by a guy like Louis XIV, who was an absolute monarch, who said, the only one that can challenge my authority is God above. And since... God's not coming down to talk to anybody to challenge Louis' authority. Uh, Louis gets to rule forever. And the dude like ruled France for like 70 years. Started as a little kid and then he ruled for his entire life. So, so the, the enlightenment comes from the fact that they're in France, they're living in kind of a politically oppressive nation. And that's what they're, they're, they're writing about. And then the writings eventually spread and more people read them and they start creating these ideas that will grow into these revolutions. So first you have, like step one is crappy society with bad leadership. Step two, people critiquing it. Step three, that being put in action. Let's think about China. Same, same kind of story. We would just say, um, so like, like, let's go Louis the XIV. Louis the Fourteenth as an absolute monarch, right? Absolute. Um, so in China, we would maybe say chaos of the Zhou. The Zhou weren't very centralized, right? And then what does that do? That causes one guy, Confucius, to start writing, start teaching a lot and writing down or teaching a lot of ideas that eventually get written down by his students. They become the Analects. Now, there's no revolution in, in China, but we eventually have one dynasty that says, hey, we should really adopt those ideas. We should start following these ideas. And what dynasty is that going to be? Han. Well, the Ming will too, but let's go in order. Shang, Zhou, Qin, Han, Shang, Zhou, Qin, Han. Uh, so we've got to get to the Han, and then all the other Chinese dynasties after uh, will follow in Confucianism. So same thing. Bad leadership, new ideas, those ideas being put into action and becoming like a reality going forward. 
Cool. Um, so last five minutes. Anything else, period five, that you want to bring up or question? Yes, ma'am. Uh, independence for Haiti, to, to end the dominance of France over Haiti, to free the slaves of Haiti from France. What else we got? This was not everything in period five, but this is like the biggest ideas that we want to make sure we have drop down. Um, and, and if you get any question about, like especially a long essay question or a short answer question on period five, I guarantee these are ideas that you're going to have to incorporate into them. Okay?